We can't sit here tonight and pretend that we deserve anything good from you at all. The truth is we're sinners. and We were born that way and by your grace, your goodness, your mercy and love, you called us, restored us, brought us from darkness to light, opened our eyes to see things like we've never seen them before, hear and understand the purity of your love in the gospel of Jesus Christ and have granted salvation to each one of us. But in that mercy and grace, Lord, you sustain us day by day. And in that mercy and grace, you pour healing and life and hope and purpose to even our worst moments, our greatest amount of tears or fears. You bring purpose into everything that we deal with in life. And in that sense, Lord, you give us cause to be alive, cause to be joyful, cause to celebrate, cause to live in appreciation of who you are and cause to uh, be glad that you have brought us into the body, Lord. So come and bless us all. Be here tonight in our praise and our thoughts and let your word just permeate our minds and hearts. We pray this all in your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. I'd like you to listen. This is a particular thing that was donated by Mabel on Wit and Wisdom Wednesday. She's not even, oh, there she is, good. I, wa I want to be so full of Christ that if a mosquito bites me, it flies away singing, there is power in the blood. So I thought, I like that. So I'm, I'm going to give Mabel the credit for that and Grandpa the appreciation for making it available to us. So we join in our opening song. You can stand if you wish. to understand what God has willed, what God has planned. I only know at His right hand there's one who is my Savior. I take Him at His word and deed. Christ died to save me this I read. And in my heart I find a need Of Him to be my Savior That He would leave His place on high And come for sinful man to die You counted strange, so once did I Solace from this spring That he who lives to be my king Once died to be my savior That he will leave his place on high And come for sinful man to die You counted strange, so once did I Before I knew my Savior, my Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. My Savior lives, my Savior loves, my Savior lives. My Savior lives.
Precious Heavenly Father, as we come together here tonight, we're drawn because of your goodness. We're drawn because of the goodness of your Holy Spirit, the kindness that has been expressed to us and drawn us from our foolish thinking and our arrogance and all the other things that we get caught up in into the truth, Lord, that we are sinners in need of a Savior and that we need mercy more today than we ever have and as much as we've ever had. So, Lord, as we gather, we ask that you would create within us a heart of true repentance, a heart that truly examines and recognizes our need for your love and grace and mercy. Lord, I thank you for your goodness, and I thank you that each day becomes a good day because you're in it, and you walk with me through it. And even though I pass through the valley of the shadow of death, or even if I have other circumstances that are my Goliaths or other circumstances that are beyond what I can possibly deal with, I know, Lord, that you are good and you have, never pro you have promised to never leave me nor forsake me. And so tonight, Lord, we stand before you confessing our sin, recognizing our need for your gift of salvation and the goodness that we can trust to have it extended to us, given to us, to empower us, and set us free. Come and bless us all, we pray, Lord, in your name. God's people say, Amen. Amen. It's your blood that cleanses me. It's your blood that gives me life. It's your blood that took my place in redeeming sacrifice, washed 
what you mean in our lives, for your graciousness to create us, for your willingness to draw us to life, and your willingness to carry us through each day until finally we deal and see you face to face. Thank you, Lord, for all these things. In your name, amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> I'm going to read you a text that's not up there before we get started comes out of Genesis chapter 131. God saw that all he had made, uh, saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Kids, why don't you come on down? We got enough right here. All in front today. Good. Squeeze together. Uh, are you good, kids? Yes. Wait, wait. What does that mean? What did I just ask you? Do you always do the dishes for your mom and dad? No. Well, then you're not good. Oh, wait. You always do all the vacuuming in the house for mom and dad, right? No, you don't. Well, you're not that good then. And you never tease your brothers or sisters or cry or scream or run around the house after... And you always pick up all your toys, right? Yes. No, no, yes. We got one yes. Yeah, you're not that good. I was going to give you candy tonight, but you're not good enough for it. So, what in the world does that word mean? Yeah, what does good mean? Obeying your mom and dad. What? Following God? Question mark? No question mark? Statement? Okay. Anyone else? I mean... Another one, what's good? I mean, you all answered you were good. What were you thinking? I asked you four or five questions. You had to say no to every one of them. I don't know what you do at home besides make noise, run around, leave dirt on the floor, never vacuum or help clean or anything else. No, oh, my goodness. You help what? I sometimes. Sometimes when you feel like it? Yeah. Oh, okay. And you don't feel like it very often because I never felt like it when I was growing up. So I was no good. But I knew that. You guys don't know that yet, right? We're going to talk about good today in the sermon. Okay? 
Because if I say something is good, we can feel one way. But if I ask you some hard questions, you all said, no, no, we don't do that, and we don't do that, and yes, we do fight with our brothers and sisters. And you understand? And one of the things that's hard is this isn't just a children's sermon. It's the sermon they're going to get. And it's a sermon the world, you know what, if they were sitting there, all the adults were sitting there, I'm not sure what answer they would give us. But here's a verse that I read to you guys. It says, when God got done creating the world, he looked at it and he said this, and it was very good. Now, people like me kind of spoiled that. And people began to sin. And they didn't help their moms and dads. And they did run around and make noise. And they did sometimes break things and tease things and push people down and pull people up. And you guys understand? So sometimes this word gets really hard to understand. Who do you think understands it, though? God does. Because when he looked at the world, he said, it is very good. Very good. So that's going to be my sermon today. And I want you to listen to see if they can ask your mom and dad later, what does good mean, okay? So tonight you get to give your parents a test going home. Dad, what does good mean? All right, see, you get to ask them that question. And if they don't pass, you come tell me. Because I'll, I'll give them a detention or something. We'll, we'll let them have a youthful moment in their life that some of them haven't gotten that far away from, actually. So, And, you know, I remember those days. So, But, you yeah, know, since then I've gotten just as bad as ever, but we're going to talk about it, okay? And guess what? No firsts. You can all go first and second. You can all just grab something. In fact, grab two because your mom and dad are hungry. Okay. Uh, take two, give one away. Uh, you guys are being very good doing that. But if you don't go faster, you're no good anymore. So what's good? Thank you, God, for the Ukraine war. Thank you, God, for the people that are dying over there. Thank you, God, because it is showing us all kinds of things. Thank you, God, for the Russians that are scaring many people to death. Thank you. Is that the prayer? Why not? How do you determine that that's the wrong prayer or that would be a not good prayer uh, that something else I would be praying would be good. Okay? How do you know how the whole Ukraine war is going to work out? How do you even know if what they're telling you is even true? You understand? We sit here with God in situations. Are you ready? We are going to celebrate Monday, Thursday, where God does wonderful things like washing the feet of the disciples and giving the gift of communion. Then he's captured, beaten, whipped, crucified into Good Friday, hung on the cross for around three hours, give or take, and he dies. And it's called Good Friday. What's good? When it goes your way, is that good? I was talking to Alyssa uh, a while ago, and we were talking about covid and uh, she had shared, you know, that the last year she wasn't able to go to college, so she did college from home and was able to do that and saved a huge amount of money. She said, I was even able to work, and uh, we both smiled at each other, and I said, in some ways, COVID did some good things, didn't it, even in the middle of the rotten things? And she understood that because her grandpa was one of the people that was taken by COVID. But she also understood that COVID had some benefits or blessings or some other side of the issue. When you say God is good all the time, you have to begin to understand what you're saying because it becomes extremely difficult if you can't come up with good clarity of why punishing Jesus the way he did, ripping the skin off his back and the things they did in the torture before they even nailed him to the cross, and all that other stuff connected with that made it a good Friday 
into the Resurrection Sunday that we get to celebrate. Because then you have to step back and ask the question, are you ready tomorrow for your good Thursday? Good Friday. And wait for your Resurrection Sunday. You understand, it is no small thing when we start asking the question or making the statement, God is good all the time. Because goodness is one of the qualities or characteristics or attributes that God possesses. One of the reasons he is God is because he is good. And so you have to understand the significance of that. And you even have to understand some of the marvelous things. Now I put the text up here. And I didn't want to just read each one and then come back to them. So I was going to read them and then go through and kind of share with you the things that I want you to be aware of. Okay? The first one comes out of Genesis chapter 2. And it says this. i got to grab my Bible here because I don't have it all printed out. Uh, Chapter 2, starting at verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There was a time when man only knew good. All right? For when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord said, it's not good for a man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Do you understand that one of the first good, separate, creative acts that God did was make women? (coughs) A man knew, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, good, I wanted to nod. Give me an amen to that. Yes, thank you very much. Um, It's important to understand that. And it's important that there is something within the framework of God to see things that are incomplete as not being good yet. So we know he completes, finishes, completes the creation on the sixth day by creating woman. And that becomes that final point where he can finally say out loud, and he looked at all he had done, and behold, it was very good. Now that's the condition that God created the world in, brought man and woman into, and everything that man and woman in one sense has done since then, in the negative sense, has tried to compromise, compromise, destroy, and infect the goodness of God. Or argue about it. Adam, what have you done? This woman you gave to me, she gave me some of the fruit and I ate it. This horrible woman, that was no good. His judgment on woman. You begin to understand how quickly man's discernment goes askew, takes a left turn, goes in a direction that's contrary to the will of God. Adam, what are you saying? Why would you even talk like this? And the answer, sin had entered his life. And you and I carry that same sin on when we get busy blaming people, situations, circumstances, and everybody else for the choice of sin that we've made. And you begin to understand, hey, Eve, what have you done? The serpent, he tempted me. He convinced me, and I was deceived, and I ate the fruit. Also a blamer. Also the opposite of good. And so that word sin, compromise, bad, enters the creation that God created that was very good, and it comes out of the mouths of Adam and Eve. And you, for the first time, you have to begin to understand you can't just sit in the front row and pretend you know everything that is good and can separate that from which is bad or evil. And so the Lord has got a lesson for us as we walk in through this time of Lent. It's to discover one more time that God is good and that he has not left you and he continues to work in your favor, and he continues to pursue goodness in your life, and he continues to bring about circumstances that create or recreate those opportunities that you or the world get, having eventually the forgiveness that was given in Jesus Christ. 
So was it good when the Lord promised a boy child will be born to Eve who will crush the head of the serpent? But his heel will be bruised. We know that that bruising cost him his life. We know, was that good or bad, that prophecy or that promise? I would say it's good because it's speaking to my salvation and dealing with my sin. But if I said, we're going to take you out for my sin, they're coming in here, they're going to tack you to the tree in the front of church there, and they're going to leave you hanging there until you're dead. I'll say thank you to you very much. Really appreciate that. You know, after all, I am the pastor, so it's good that you are willing to say, you go, what are we talking about? Suddenly, good, evil, right, wrong become a complex little thing, and it is no small thing. But God has not lost sense of what's good or what's evil. God continues to be very much aware of it. If you take a moment and turn to Genesis <clears throat> chapter 41, the next text up there, Genesis 41. I want to read another section to you, weigh it with the same kind of questions that we're dealing with. In 41, starting at verse 28, uh, this is uh, Joseph interpreting Pharaoh's dreams. Joseph has been falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. Joseph has been falsely tried and found guilty and is thrown in prison. Joseph did some nice things for people in prison. He asked them to mention it to Pharaoh so that maybe he would get out. They don't tell Pharaoh about it. And Joseph spends years more in prison. Good or bad? You understand? How would you and I interpret it? If it was my father, my son, my daughter, my wife, my husband, I could have a difficult time saying this is good. And you begin to understand this lesson. So now starting up there at verse 28, it goes on. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh that what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt. But seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. And the abundance of the land will not be remembered, because the famine that follows, it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. Good or bad? You understand that, how complex a situation can become. You and I understand, as they go on in other places to address this very topic, it's this dream, this situation, this famine, this guaranteed suffering to come upon millions of people in Egypt and the surrounding areas is the very thing God used then to accomplish his purposes of establishing Joseph, of bringing safety for the children of Israel, of bringing about the beginning of the nation of the Jews. But you and I have to recognize that if I say God is good all the time, if I was in the middle of that situation and I was an Egyptian, I'm not sure what I would be thinking. And you begin to understand how difficult and challenging it is. But the promise in the very nature of God, God looks at you and says, I don't do anything that is not good. Now you start to think about the significance of that and the challenge for you and I is trying to figure out how do I come in line with that? How do I spend my years in jail, falsely accused, betrayed by friends, and everything else that I may live in my life or out in my life and all the unique circumstances that you represent as you come and sit here tonight, you begin to understand the significance of it. And the significance of it is God is good. Now we know this because in the last lesson, if you turn to chapter 50 now, <clears throat> and we start reading there at verse 19, goes on, 
I'm going to just start at 18 just to give you a little flavor there. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves. They're terrified. Uh, Joseph's father has died. The boys are convinced that Joseph has been waiting for the opportunity to get even with them for the wickedness that they did. We call it wickedness because it was wickedness. And the Bible defines it as wickedness. And if your brothers and sisters took you, threw you into a pit, and sold you into slavery, and you lost contact with your family, anticipating never seeing them again, you would also understand why it was not viewed as good. But then we get to the text that I wanted you to read with me tonight. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me. Not good. But God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Good or bad, we start to understand the complexity of your life and my life. We start to understand the complexity of cars breaking down, people getting sick, people living, people dying, families staying together, families coming under pressure, circumstances of corrupt and wicked government officials, Wars in Ukraine and other situations around the world. And you begin to understand what is God calling his church to understand? Is there evil? Absolutely. Does it work out there? Very consistently. Is Satan Satan pursuing ways to break you, to convince you that God is not good, to convince you that you have a right to be angry with God, to be rebellious with God, to shame God, embarrass God, humiliate God because he does not deliver on the quality of work that you perceive that you're contributing into the kingdom. I mean, how many of us don't bargain with God and say, I'm good enough, I'm working hard, I've made a lot of improvements, I no longer drink as much or smoke as much or swear as much or cheat as much. You know, and the list goes on and on and we think somehow we've got bargaining chips we can throw up before God, and God looks at us and says, what are you doing? You don't have anything in your package of life, your box of everything you've accumulated that I want or that I need. I have come because I am good to save you who are not good and give to you my goodness and change your heart. That's the very nature So here's Joseph actually in his own way in the place of God. You understand? He says, who am I to be in the place of God? He's talking about judgment. Who am I to punish you? Who am I to say, you are wicked, evil men? And they were. And he could have been justified by every human standard if he would have punished them. But instead he says, who am I? Am I God to do that against you? He said, no, I'm not. And yet at the same time, This is what he demonstrates, a totally different characteristic of God. Undeserved mercy. It's called grace. They did not deserve what Joseph offered them in that moment. Instead, Joseph, manifesting the character of God, looked at them and recognized that this was the only way that they were going to survive. They needed to be reassured. And he spoke it from his heart. That's what makes it such an interesting situation. When Joseph said, am I God to punish you? How many times have you or I, I want to get even with? How many times have we felt it, thought it, created our own little scenario of words and thoughts to follow it through? And instead, we begin to understand Joseph is setting for us the example of the goodness of God. Let's see. What does God want me to do with my enemies? What does Jesus do on the cross with the people that nailed him there? Father, forgive them. What did Joseph do to these wretched brothers who hated him so much? Okay? Hated him so much. They wished he'd never lived and just took the money for him and ran. 
I forgive you. He is an example, literally, of the goodness of God. And so you and I, realizing that God does understand goodness, he is the only one that understands goodness, and he understands goodness from the beginning of Joseph being thrown into the pit and the goodness of the mercy that carried him through those years with Potiphar, false accusation, years in prison, until finally he is raised to that position as assistant to Pharaoh alone and rescues millions of people by what God revealed to that man. That we begin to understand the goodness of God doesn't fit into Bruce Harmon's world. I cannot figure out the goodness of God. I can see it when Scripture shares it. I know what God is calling me, what's good and not good, to forgive, not forgiving, or is wrong, and those kind of things. But I cannot, in and of myself, look at a situation and declare Ukraine is bad. It's good to break the back of this country. She deserves it. I hope gasoline goes to $12 a gallon. And you go out once or twice a week and you can't afford groceries anymore. And you have to sell your houses. Is that good or bad? Well, I wouldn't actually wish that on you. I would see that as something mean, cruel, or foolish. But I do understand if that's within God's plan, here's the challenge. Look what God has done. Look at the way he's responded. Look at the way he carries and ministers through the wickedness of the world, the evil of even what Satan brought into the world. Satan brings in consequence and sin into Adam and Eve's life. God brings in the promise of a Savior. Satan brings in uh, the, the wickedness and the, the suffering that was going to be associated with the famine. And God brings in the solution in Joseph and restores and brings about salvation in terms of living life for the people that eventually were going to become the Israelites. And that's the context that I want you to begin to understand. Lord, show me what real good is. Show me if I'm not really good. Because one of the hardest things is that it's so easy to defend myself or lie to myself. Are you kids good? They, they didn't know because I started asking the question. And I begin to go, that's the same thing God's got to do with you and me. Your wife would say you're always understanding. You're a kind, expressive man with a tender of heart, always showing her the respect she deserves. And of course, your husband, you, know, you begin to, oh, well, should I go through the list? Create the set of questions until your kids are right. Talk about what your kids think. Talk about what your neighbors think. Talk about what's going on inside your head, even in the middle of a sermon, right? Or does only my mind wander while I've given sermons? What was I talking about? Squirrel. You understand? Those are the things that we're capable of. And so you begin to understand God has got this work. And I think he wants us to do this during Lent, to realize the goodness of God is the grace of God that is extended to you even in the middle of suffering, pain, difficulty, and all those who have gone before. We'll be working our way through different sections of Scripture and addressing the topic of God's goodness, finding out what Scripture really has to say about the goodness of God and what that really means and how we get to live with it, in it, and have it work in our lives and put our trust in it. Pray with me if you would. Lord, I don't bring any goodness with me, but I do know, Lord, that your goodness is working on me all the time. I do know, Lord, when your goodness is trying to move me in a direction of forgiveness or love or kindness, and I walk away from it, or I fight it, or I pretend I'm really good and I'm really not. And I know, Lord, that your intent is to do good even in this time of Lent, to bring about such a level of repentance that the goodness ha finds room to express itself and produce fruit in my life. And so, Lord, you are good all the time. And for that, we thank you. And we praise you. And we ask that this would be a time of celebration, that our Lenten season would be a time of reflection, 
of faithfulness and obedience that we would know all the time, Lord, you are good. We pray this all in your name, Jesus. God's people say, amen. Today as we pray, are there any special prayer requests that anyone has? That the I'm going to pray and then we'll close with the last song, which is the Lord's Prayer. So you guys can move up there and we'll kind of just finish and we're going to sing the Lord's Prayer at the end of it. So just pray with me. Lord, uh, I continue to pray for Jim Sensky for the healing he needs in his back. I rebuke, Lord, anything that might be putting him under attack or uh, just trying to break his spirit. I pray, Father, for the, the work that is, uh, seems to be requiring a, a miracle beyond anything doctors or anyone else can do. By your name and in your name and under your authority, we pray for that healing, the rebuke of anything unspiritual that might be in there around him or attacking him and that you would set his spirit free, Lord. We pray, Lord, for brothers and sisters who have lost loved ones and uh, how hard it is sometimes, Lord, to say you are good all the time. But in the middle of it, Lord, you continue to work the miracle of life and hope and purpose and meaning. And that you have not left us and you know the pain and the suffering we can be carrying. We all pray for the mercy and grace our children need, that they would be filled with your love and Holy Spirit, that those who are drifting would come back, that those who have lost sight of you would be moved to come back and be faithful into your word and back into the fellowship of believers. We pray, Lord, for just marriages to be healed. We pray, Lord, for a spirit of forgiveness to be upon this congregation. We pray, Lord, for holiness to enter into our lives, not that we bring it, but that we experience its presence because of your holiness, your goodness brought into our lives through your mercy and grace. So come and bless us all as we sing this closing prayer, Lord. Let it be uh, for your glory and for you alone that we sing. In your name, Jesus. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance toward you and give you his peace. We rise for the closing prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Thank you.